this special broadcast that we are bringing to you in collaboration with Voice of America. Now, semiconductor supply chains have been a crucial issue in the recent past. So, finance ministers from seven largest global economies have vowed to work closely with developing nations on this issue. The G7 leaders, in fact, see a chunk of supply chains in a single country to be simply undesirable. The Voice of America's Keith Kotinsky decodes from New York as to how this plan will work out. Here at this factory, tucked into the forest next to Malta, New York, a three-hour drive north from New York City, is a nearly three million square foot space dedicated to U.S. semiconductor manufacturing. In our modern day, everything you use has chips involved with it. Multinational semiconductor manufacturer Global Foundries, headquartered at this location, runs this facility. Here, they produce 400,000 of these 12-inch wafers annually. Each wafer contains anywhere from 100 to 4,500 semiconductor microchips used in everything from computers, smartphones, and automobiles to national defense. The semiconductor chip is really the, the brain of the device, and it allows that device to function and provide logic. The United States invented semiconductor microchips but currently only accounts for about 10% of global manufacturing, with more than 75% of production occurring in East Asia. If we cannot import the semiconductors, you know, the automakers are impacted, the smartphone devices are impacted, right? The ramifications are so huge. Growing U.S.-China tensions and Beijing's threats to occupy Taiwan, a major global chip producer, can put the U.S. semiconductor imports at risk. The United States got a taste of the microchip shortage as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, with the auto industry being hit the hardest. The automakers uh, needed to find out really quickly, where are we getting these chips and why don't we have enough of them? Right? And that was sort of a, the classic example of, oh my gosh, we have a shortage. Experts believe the shortage is easing, but still affecting car makers. Having both the manufacturing facilities and then these think tanks, the knowledge centers, both within the U.S. border, I think it's, it's really, really important for the U.S. On August 9, 2022, President Joe Biden signed the Chips and Science Act into law, providing $52 billion to promote domestic semiconductor manufacturing and research and development, along with tax credits. The Biden administration called for a, a meeting. Secretary Raimondo was heavily involved at the White House where CEOs of car makers, CEO of, com of companies like Global Foundries came together. The meeting helped plant the seed to ink a decade long-term deal, making Global Foundries the main semiconductor chip producer for General Motors, announced in February of 2023. As far as the GM agreement, I'd say first and foremost, that's about national security and bringing the technology onshore. And we're gonna be working over the next few years to make sure that technology works and that capacity comes online for them to avert the, the next crisis. Since the shortage, many American-based companies announced hundreds of billions in investment to semiconductor production stateside. Global Foundries plans to increase production at its New York facility and built a new $1 billion space on site, doubling its capacity. Keith Kosinski for VOA News, New York. And also to give us more perspective, we're being joined in by Voice of America's correspondent, Jessica Stone. She's joining us live from the White House in Washington, D.C. Jessica, now the American Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, is en route to Japan for the G7 foreign ministers meeting. He's also made a stop in Vietnam on the way. So what more can you tell us? Well, just as my colleague Keith outlined the need for supply chain diversification on the diplomatic front, that conversation is taking place all over Southeast Asia when U.S. officials make trips to the region. And that's what's happening uh, as Antony Blinken, the U.S. Secretary of State, goes to Vietnam. Uh, you know, part of the U.S. strategy has not only been uh, diplomatically strengthening partnerships with uh, Southeast Asian nations, essentially China's neighbors, but also having a conversation with them about diversifying supply chains from China to those neighbors, and Vietnam is a prime example of that. Uh, Hanoi and Washington diplomatically are going to discuss talking about elevating the diplomatic partnership from a comprehensive partnership to a strategic partnership. And so far, Hanoi has really been reticent to do that, concerned about Beijing's reaction. But what's working in Washington's favor here 
is that Hanoi is increasingly concerned about competing claims with China in the South China Sea uh, and the idea that military might should not decide those territorial claims, but rather international law should. And that is what U.S. diplomats say forms the basis of the relations they are building with their Vietnamese counterparts. Mohammed. All right. Very interesting. Now, the f foreign and the defense ministers of the Philippines and the United States all met this week in Washington. They've announced additional military drills in the South China Sea. Now, what are the implications for peace in the Indo-Pacific? Well, look, there's definitely an increased potential for miscalculation because you have an elevated tempo here of military drills in the region. As you talked about, there are three weeks now going on of the U.S. and Philippines military drills in the South China Sea, in the Taiwan Strait, uh, and they are going to, for the first time, be doing live fire exercises. This involves more than 18,000 military personnel. Uh, and you also, at the same time, have elevated drills from China in regards to what just happened with the uh, meeting of Kevin McCarthy the U.S. House Speaker with the leader of Taiwan, Tsai Ing-wen. Uh, you also have the potential now in the announcement that there will be additional military drills taking place in the South China Sea with the U.S., the Philippines, Japan, and, uh, and Australia later this year. And so you really do have an elevated uh, chance of a miscalculation. And you know, earlier this week, President Xi Jinping, the president of China, visited China's Navy this week and said, you need to be ready, armed forces, for real combat, not simulated combat, but real combat. So there's this ongoing concern, of course, around the potential for a Beijing invasion of Taiwan. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says we have to keep the uh, channels of communication open with China, even as U.S.-China relations are worsening. We need to be able to talk. We need to be able to deconflict in the event that we have any miscalculations in the region. Mohammed? Absolutely indeed. That, of course, is one of the pressure points in, in geostrategy. Uh, Jessica, do continue to stay on with this because I want you to weigh in on an explosive interview with the Pakistani Defense Minister Khwaja Asif has in fact given to Voice of America, wherein Khwaja Asif, the Defense Minister of Pakistan, has warned that Pakistan would be willing to carry out strikes, airstrikes on any kind of terror hideouts inside of Afghanistan. This is if Kabul fails to stop the anti-Pakistan elements. He was especially specifically referring to the Tehreek e Taliban Pakistan. And Voice of America's Islamabad Bureau Chief Sara Zaman brings you this exclusive interview, isn't it? So the Afghan Taliban deny providing any safe haven to Pakistani Taliban at this point. Do you believe the Afghan Taliban when they say that? They, they, they still operate from their side, you know. That, so you don't that, believe what the Afghan Taliban are saying? That's, that's, uh, that could be partially uh, true. But uh, there are um, um, Pakistani Taliban who are operating from across the border. Uh, let's come to the U.S. Uh, you have recently said that Pakistani Taliban are using weapons left by the Americans in Afghanistan. That's correct. Have you provided any evidence of that to the Americans? It, it's, it can be seen all over the place. In the streets of Kabul, you know, I saw it myself. No, but in Pakistan, if if TTP is using weapons that the Americans no, if, left, if, if if Taliban mm -hmm. in Afghanistan are using American weapons, their Humvees, their uh, armored cars, their rifles, night vision, their armor, all sorts of uh, um, uh, even helicopters they are using, and uh, so um, uh, these uh, uh, Pakistani Taliban were part of uh, that struggle. In but, have you seen, but have you and seen any crossover, any cross-border penetration of that equipment? Obvi or is this an the assumption? Uh, is it a two plus two case? No, 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 or have you seen no, no, concrete no, no, evidence? No, no, no. Uh, the, 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 uh, the light weapons, you know, like the assault uh, rifle or uh, ammunition or uh, night vision uh, goggles or uh, sniper rifles, you know, they definitely they have uh, uh, they are carrying the, uh, the stuff which uh, the Americans left in a hurry. So have you brought this up with Washington? What is the use of talking to Washington? Washington left that uh, that sort of uh, hardware on uh, Afghan soil because they couldn't carry it, you know. So they the left reason why I ask this is because when we ask the State Department officials that Pakistan is saying these weapons are being used against Pakistan now by the Tehreek e Taliban Pakistan, the response was that we don't have an independent assessment of this. So that is why I was asking that have you given any independent assessment that 
This you know, is, and then, and then if maybe they're, ask they're, for help in fighting terrorism. Have you asked the U.S. for any help in fighting terrorism? Would you want? Do you need their help in fighting terrorism in Pakistan? Have they fought successfully uh, the terrorism in the past? I'm asking you. You know, Pakistan is already you know uh, you know uh, suffering from uh, our participation, our uh, wrong decisions, which we took in the 80s and uh, after 9/11. So, talking to Americans on these issues is uh, of uh, hardly any any. Um, there's hardly any. I I don't see any uh, logic in that. You know. Do you not see any value in collaborating with Washington to fight terrorism? My personal view is this: uh, we can take uh, care of the this this uh, menace ourselves. You know, we have taken care of this menace ourselves uh, way back. Uh, in um, the operation Zarbeyaz uh, and operation Radul Fasad, and uh, peace was restored all over uh, Pakistan. But uh, this this resurgence of terrorism in Pakistan is basically a very grave mistake made by uh, PTI government, you know, and the then leadership. All right, so that was Pakistan's Defense Minister Khwaja Asif there. And also to give us more perspective on this explosive Voice of America exclusive interview, we have Jessica Stone. She's joining us live from Washington, D.C., from at the White House. And this, this, of course, we'll try reconnect with Jessica in just a bit. I'm told that we've seemed to have lost the line with Jessica Stone. But this, remember, is an explosive charge which the Pakistani Defense Minister Khwaja Asif has made, where he has said, where he is in no uncertain terms categorically said that Pakistan now reserves the right and could in the near future carry out strikes deep within the Afghan territory if the Afghan Taliban do not crack down on the Pakistani Taliban. Remember the Tehrik-e Taliban Pakistan are joined to the Afghan Taliban virtually at the hip. It is almost impossible to see as to how things will of course proceed from here. The reason why these developments are being looked out with a lot of consternation within Pakistan is this. For several decades, the Pakistani deep state had in fact trained and it had patronized the Afghan Taliban. And now what we are looking at is, is, is pretty strange. You know, two nations that were pretty close allies in 2021 now appear to be sworn enemies in 2023. And I'm told that we've got Jessica Stone back online with us. Jessica, we just heard from the Pakistani Defence Minister where he's of course gone on and said that Islamabad is willing to strike targets inside Afghanistan when it comes to protecting Pakistan from terrorism. Now, what are the implications of these? Well, it's a tacit admission, certainly, that Afghanistan is once again becoming a haven for terrorists, which, of course, was part of the U.S. calculation to keep troops there in America's longest war to prevent that very thing from happening. Uh, and a former top diplomat at the U.S. State Department in Kabul uh, told Foreign Policy magazine, look, this is an alarming, quote, an alarming miscalculation by Washington to think that the U.S. has common cause with the Taliban when it comes to keeping terrorists out uh, of Afghanistan. Uh, such as the Islamic State, such as Al Qaeda, uh, or that the Taliban is even working hard to keep those groups out of the country and to keep them from planning and executing uh, attacks not only on Afghanistan and its neighbors, but right. uh, elsewhere. A and we know that the Taliban continues to work with Al Qaeda and uh, hasn't forced other groups out of the country either. But right. Washington needs uh, to be able to keep its over the horizon uh, ability to attack inside uh, Afghanistan as well, which is how they've promised uh, to mitigate for this. But they do need intelligence on the ground. Ground, and that means they have to be able to work with the Taliban to accomplish it. All right, very interesting there, but we've completely run out of time. Thank you very much indeed, Jessica Stone, for joining us from Washington, D.C. and getting us all those insights there. And with that, it's also a wrap on this edition of the News Bulletin. Stay tuned to Beyond.